alive. I'm hoping Mark is not pulling my leg. Hello! Welcome to Healthcare Triage Live. We really appreciate your tuning in every week, uh, very much. Um, while we wait for the rest of the people to click over and join, our usual housekeeping, um, as always, check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash healthcare triage. The Reddit, is, uh, the Reddit group is growing, and as I said, I pop in every once in a while to answer questions. That's reddit.com slash r slash hc triage. You can get... I, every week I forget about the poster, but you can get merch like this wonderful mug and then the lovely poster over at hctmerch.com. I nailed it that time, hctmerch.com. No one's even looking at me. And anyway, um, and of course, we really always appreciate your support at patreon.com. Patreon.com slash healthcare triage. Yes, patreon.com slash healthcare triage. Anything you can do to help. We're, things are always getting better over here. We're, we're growing the studio. We're making all kinds of changes. We've got some big, ambitious plans for some episodes coming up. Patreon.com slash healthcare triage. You can't be the Surgeon Admiral anymore, of course, unfortunately, because Sam has become the Surgeon Admiral. We only have committed to one Surgeon Admiral. But you could always just wait. Maybe there'll be something else. I don't know. Anyway, let's get started. Question number one. I got to scroll down here. Question number one, James Craver. What do you wish was talked about in the debates last night concerning health care? The number one thing I wish was discussed at the debates not concerning health care was that awesome guy that looked like Gandalf. Um, I'm only going to spend 10 seconds on this, but man, that picture brings me nothing but joy. I tweeted it out many times if you want to go look. The number one not the number one health care thing. So... I mean, there's some interesting things that have been going on in the campaign right now that, that didn't get discussed. One is um, about drug pricing, and, and uh, Hillary Clinton has had some ideas, good or bad, they could certainly be debated, on how we could uh, get government regulation more involved or at least get some thoughtful criteria applied to how much we're going to pay for drugs. Of course, there are arguments to be made on why drugs should cost a decent amount of money and why some drugs are expensive, but there are sometimes when they... Those arguments don't hold water. We did a recent episode on healthcare triage news about that. Um, but, you know, there are economists, I think, on both sides of the aisle who think some of her ideas are good and bad. Um, and it would have been nice to hear that discussed. It would also just be, you know, the Cadillac tax, the, the tax on um, high cost uh, employer sponsored plans or regular plans um, seems to be losing favor. Uh, I think people, again, on both sides of the aisle are talking about repealing that. I would have been curious to hear what the candidates thought about that. Uh, certainly, we still have issues that need to be resolved, such as long-term chip reauthorization. Uh, there are some problems still with the family glitch, the idea that subsidies apply only, you know, the subsidies go away for people if their job offers them an individual plan. Even if they wanted to buy a plan for their family, they can get no subsidies for them. It's just this little glitch that's in the law. I'm a pediatrician. It bothers me that therefore children would be uh, uninsured or that potentially families could be uninsured. So there's still lots of things to discuss. Even if you buy into the whole Obamacare is great and we're going to go forward and everything's going to be fine with it, there are some things concerning health care that still should be brought up. Costs are a real problem still. Delivery is still a real problem. Outcomes are still a problem. How we can make better quality in the health care system, totally unaddressed for the most part um, by much of the law that's in place right now and something we could absolutely talk about. So thank you, James Craver, for that question. Question number two, Terrytown. On mental floss, it was mentioned that eating 40 pounds of peanut butter increases your risk of death by one micromort. Is that actually a micromort? Yeah, it's an underwriting thing. Hmm. Due to aflatoxin B, higher risk of liver cancer. Should I be worried? I love peanut butter. I, this is interesting to me. So here's the thing. I'm going to bet all the money in my pocket this was not a randomized controlled trial. That we did not randomize people to either get or not get 40 tablespoons of peanut butter a day, a week. What was that? A day? I don't even know. Whatever it was, I bet it wasn't a randomized controlled trial. So that risk of death is very much likely to do to an epidemiologic study, some kind of association. It might even be a case control study, um, in which case I would not bet the farm on that being real. I also don't know how big a deal a micromort is. Um, so it's very, I wouldn't, I don't think I would be worried. I do think I'd be worried, however, if you're eating 40 tablespoons of peanut butter a day, that's a lot of peanut butter. Um, just calories wise, that's a lot. Um, GI tract wise, that's a lot. I'd be less worried about the risk of liver cancer than um, 
which bowel habits might be like, for instance, with eating that much. I just don't even know. Uh, regardless, I, I, I don't think that that's probably, you know, causal proved randomized controlled trial. I bet that that is more likely an association and that that association involves other things as well. Perhaps people that eat that much peanut butter also tend to be heavy drinkers. I don't know. Um, but this isn't anything I ever caution patients about or something I worry about on a daily basis. So I probably, you know, wouldn't. But as always, talk about that with your doctor. Nothing I say on Healthcare Triage or Healthcare Triage Live should ever be construed as medical advice. You should talk to your healthcare provider specifically about any questions you may have personally about your own health. And now Mark has calmed down. Lisa Jones, what's the weirdest study you've ever read in a reputable journal? So when I was in college, I remember taking a class where um, these people got a grant from the federal government to prove that when men are sexually aroused, they get erections. I really thought that was obvious or just known. Um, I was amazed that they needed some sort of randomized controlled trial for that. Um, but it existed. And then I saw even more studies that they did when I was in medical school. They even showed this strange movie. You'd be amazed at what they've studied. Um, there are, but it's like, you know, so that was a little odd. There are weird studies in the sense of like, I'm often amazed at what people feel the need to study, but none of them like are jumping out at me. There was a, one of my favorite papers um, with sort of a tongue-in-cheek paper on how, and this is good for me always to remember as a, as a gut check, on how we shouldn't really believe in parachutes so much because there hasn't been a randomized controlled trial um, proving that they work. And really all the evidence we have that parachutes work is epidemiologic um, and retrospective. So therefore we shouldn't we shouldn't necessarily believe in the causality and we shouldn't. But of course it's, it, that paper was meant to sort of show us that not everything can be studied in randomized controlled trials, nor does everything have to be studied in randomized controlled trials for us to believe in them. Um, and so while I will sit here on my high horse in my ivory tower and sometimes lecture you on how the randomized controlled trial hasn't been done, that doesn't mean that I'm always right about that. It also doesn't mean that the randomized control, controlled trial will always be done. Um, it can't be sometimes because of ethical reasons or logistical reasons. We're never going to have a randomized controlled trial of smoking. It's never going to happen. Never. Um, and that is what lets the tobacco companies say it's never been proven that, that smoking causes cancer because we don't have an RCT. And we're not going to have an RCT because the epidemiologic evidence is so large and convincing we're not going to. We will never have an RCT of breastfeeding either. We will never randomize moms and say, you breastfeed and you bottle feed and let's see what happens to your kids. And that means we won't ever have all this great causal information about what breastfeeding does. But we can't. That's not ethical. We can't do that. Um, and so sometimes you have to live with what you can get. It's always good to remember that. I just slapped the desk. That's not good. Um, and now we'll move on. This is a follow-up from last week. Zizga Zenit one asked, Dr. Carroll, you misunderstood the birth control question. She was asking, is it safe to, to only non-placebos every day? Ah, okay. I did hear from a number of you after this. So last week, someone asked a question about... Um, taking their birth control and saying that she skipped the placebo week. And I answered it assuming that what she meant was I'm just not going to take the placebos, which are often like iron, um, and like just skip the week and then restart up again. But a number of you believed that she was asking me, can I skip the placebo week and just start up the pill the next week? Don't do that. That's not how the pill is supposed to be taken. Um, there's supposed to be a break so that one – women menstruate and two it just keeps it on a normal one month cycle which is what it is trying to do um and so no you're not supposed to skip the placebo and just keep taking the pill you can theoretically safely just skip the placebo and not take pills that day but that's not a great idea for the mid reasons i mentioned last week you might get lost in your cycle and figuring out which day you are or what time you're going to take it or get off track or you might be you know missing out on that wonderful iron if you need it but don't don't and this still should not be taken as medical advice. I'm just speaking theoretically in a vacuum. But if I were taking the pill, um, I would not skip the placebo week and just start up the next week's pills prescription. I, I would not do that. Next question. Benjamin asks, I've recently heard of the blood type diet. Is this diet the food you eat has a direct impact on the efficiency and metabolism of your overall health? Is there any truth to this? No, there's no truth. No, there's no truth to it. I, I, I'm physically keeping my eyes from rolling right now. Um, 
There's no truth to the blood type diet. I've seen no studies whatsoever that back this up. And I just rolled my eyes and I apologize. Um, there, yeah, the idea that you need to eat a specific diet that's keyed to your blood type. You know, the human race would have died out long ago if this was the case. How do any animals know what their blood type are and what type of diet they're eating? How, how do you know? You know, before they discovered blood types, which isn't that long ago. Was that Edward Jenner? I can't even remember these days. Um, but before they did that, people didn't even know what blood types they are. They certainly certainly weren't trying to key their diet to what they imagined their blood type to be. That's just not not how it works. And in most of the world still, people probably don't know what their blood type I often can't remember offhand what my blood type is. So, yeah, and you can be perfectly healthy. There's, there's nothing to this at all. Um, I don't even want to spend too much time in trying to explain the theory behind what that is because there is no evidence for it really at all. There just isn't. Luke Coomber asks, for many years I've been told that antioxidants are useful in reducing the risk of cancer and are influencing general health. Is this true? Recently I've been hearing mixed responses either way. As always, thank you for the show, DFTBA. Until the end there, I thought you were trolling me because um, we've done many episodes uh, where we've talked about supplements and antioxidants and things like that. So this is what antioxidants are um, things in your blood that scoop up what we call free radicals, um, which are really sort of electrons flying around, which can do damage to DNA or to other structures if they're flying around in there. What antioxidants do is grab them and keep that from happening. So in theory, and in reality, I guess I should say, antioxidants that are already in your body are often working to prevent damage. And some animal studies have shown that, you know, if, if, if animals get low in those antioxidants, you get damaged. And if you give them the antioxidants or replace that, then there's benefit. And so this started this whole idea that we can give people tons of extra antioxidants and they're going to see this life prolonging benefit. And when I remember when I was in college, this was like the excitement du jour, sort of like... Um, the microbiome feels like today, where everybody's really excited about it. Um, but it didn't pan out in any kind of research for a number of reasons. One, if you're deficient in something, giving you that can often prevent harm. But if you are normal in it, that doesn't mean that giving you more is awesome. If I am vitamin C deficient, then giving me vitamin C will prevent the scurvy I would get. But when you give me extra vitamin C, all I'm doing is creating very expensive vitamin C laden urine. That's it. Um, it doesn't, there's no, their body doesn't store it magically. The body doesn't say, oh my God, here's this extra vitamin C. Evolutionarily, I've just been waiting for this to happen so that now I can be better. It's not how it works. It doesn't work. So when we have done studies, also there's tons of antioxidants. So which one do you mean? But when we've done studies giving people mega doses of different vitamins or different things that we think are antioxidants, the, the, the literature overall, overall says, that it doesn't do anything. Like you don't get the cancer prevention, you don't get the heart disease prevention, you don't live longer, none of the benefits are seen. Um, this is, I'm trying to remember which episode it is. I encourage you to go watch, I think it's the episode on meta-analysis where I specifically address, um, it's on systematic review of meta-analysis where we talk about organic foods. It's the second episode we did on organic foods because one of the reasons that the newer studies are claiming that organic foods are healthier is because they have higher levels of antioxidants. And of course, they have to come up with 16,000 different definitions to try to find the one that is true. But in some measured foods in those studies, there were higher levels of the antioxidants than in the conventionally grown produce. And therefore, they said antioc that the, the organic food is healthier. That is premised on the idea that the antioxidants do something, which of course, I just got through explaining don't. And so one, that's not necessarily how I would define healthier. And two, even if it is, it didn't result in any kind of improvement in people's health. And so for that reason, the antioxidants just don't seem to work in the idea that we can supplement or give people extra amounts of them to influence health. And that was a long-winded answer for you, but I hope I was pretty thorough. Jonathan Thompson, is there any research on the long-term effects of eating food cooked only by microwave? I mean, RCTs, no, again, we're not randomizing people and then following them out decades later to see how the food's heated up. But it's important to understand how microwaves work. It, you know, I think we, we talked about this, I think, in the episode on cell phones. All ionizing and non ionizing all radiation is not the same. There's ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. And the radiation that people freak out about, the kind that's like cosmic radiation and screwing up your DNA and 
giving you, um, you know, skin cancer is not the same kind of radiation that comes out of, you know, cell phones and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and microwaves, which is really, if I, I don't, I'm going to get this backwards. I'm pretty sure it's the non-ionizing radiation type. I hope um, no one's nodding and giving me, oh, crap. Um, I'm on my own here, on the ledge. I think it's non-ionizing. It's the good kind. It's the kind that doesn't give you cancer. And all it's doing is really heating up the water and the food. It's not like we're, it's not like we're hitting it with gamma rays and then, you know, potentially someone could turn into the Hulk. That's not how microwaves work. It's non-ionized, non-ionizing radiation, if I'm correct on that, which is not the kind that sort of gives you cancer, changes your DNA. It's affecting only the food in there. It's not changing the food structure or altering it or like, you know, the ability if you put a mouse in there, it'll become a super mouse or like that's how you get Spider-Man. That's not how it works. It's just sort of heating up the water molecules and that's what makes the food hotter. So I think that the overwhelming evidence would be that food heated in the microwave is not hurting you. Um, having said that again, no RCT. I, I can't say definitively and causally. Liam MD asks, how do strength training and cardiovascular workouts affect the body differently? Well, strength training is intended to build muscle mass. Um, you're basically straining your muscles, which causes micro damage. And when the body heals or whatever, the muscle grows. Um, that is the way that the body responds. And so when you do strength training, you're trying to build muscle mass. Cardiovascular training, theoretically, is about improving your cardio, you know, pulmonary ability or capacity so that you can, you know, no, I won't say live, but that you can do physical activity for a longer period of time. Um, and so it allows you to run further or be more active or do more stuff. The latter, the cardiovascular stuff, is probably the stuff that's a little more important for health. Um, you know, when you get the benefits from exercise, it is probably uh, a bit more uh, about, you know, improving th that than it is about strength training. So two different things. The latter, the cardiovascular is probably the one that gives you the health benefits. Medlife crisis. I like that name. Hi, my question is, what are the next big developments in cardiology over the next few decades? Are stem cells really going to do anything in relation to the heart? I have no idea. I wish I did. Um mm -hmm. I imagine they'll keep doing stuff with valves and pacing and preventing heart attack. I don't know. I don't know. It's a great question. I This is not my area of expertise. I can't tell you. Scott Walters, how do I help my tennis elbow injury heal faster, which I'm surprised I got since I do not play tennis? Also, what causes tennis elbow so I don't repeat this experience? I think it's like a repetitive stress injury or it's like that's what it is. So whatever you're doing that's repetitive stress wise, I stop, use the other arm, rest it. Um, this is a this is a perfect time for you to talk to your healthcare professional since I, I don't know. Um, I wish I did. That would make me a phenomenal doctor. I'm going to I'm going to say you this one you got to talk to your doctor. James Craver, weighing concerns like the amount of research needed to cure and the number of people affected by a disease. What disease or are you conditioned do you wish was more studied? Um So I just wrote a piece about have we there's the autism one aired yet? No, upcoming healthcare triage episode. In fact, it might be Monday. Is yeah. it this Monday? It's this coming up Monday. Um Wait and see, James Craver. Because um, actually, I, I do think that there are, I think unfortunately we focus on things, I mean, it's my personal bias. I think we focus on things at the older age of the spectrum much more than we do the younger age. I'm a pediatrician. Um, I think there are lifelong chronic conditions that we sort of just poo-poo, ignoring the fact that they cost us a fortune long term. One of these is autism. We spend, and of course, all the research I feel like I ever see on autism is about constantly proving that vaccines don't cause it, as opposed to getting at the root of what actually does cause it, how we might make it better, what we can do to make people's lives better. There's your answer. Watch the episode on Monday. Tweet it out to the world. Ronald Hirsch, why does the FDA continue to allow the use of surrogate markers when many of them have no correlation at all with clinical outcomes? It's hard to do research and super expensive. And... In a perfect world, we would demand that we would use hard outcomes like all-cause mortality. But 
you know, we do such a good job of preventing death in general that we would have to study huge numbers of people for long periods of time to often see real outcomes like death or cardiovascular outcome to actually see them occur so that we have enough of them so that we can see real differences. And it's hard to do those studies. Um, we, we could demand it, but that, but sometimes it's just not practical. I mean, if, you know, if, if only one in 10,000 people have a bad outcome and we need to see like a hundred of those outcomes, we have to be studying, you know, a million people. Um, over years, that, it's in, it's in, like not possible often in randomized controlled trials to do that. People will drop out; they get lost to follow up. You know, so that's sometimes the FDA does it because they have to. Now, I I think there are times when we could decide not to use surrogate markers, and they do, um, and that would be a good reason. And that's a time when we should, but that's not always the case, and it's not always easy. So, you know, sometimes you do it because you have to. Sometimes they probably could do a better job. We got to find the one way in the middle. Jeff Dumas asks, in the comments, I asked about using milk to prevent heartburn. One cup daily seems to cure, <laughs> cure persistent heartburn to me. Does this sound all right to you? I know you're trolling me. Um, <laughs> milk? Ugh. I don't know. If it works for you, that's fine. If one cup daily cures your persistent heartburn, go ahead. Um, as I've said many, many times before, you know, drink milk because you want to. You just shouldn't drink it because you need to. It's not probably going to hurt you. If it's really making your heart burn better, so be it. But I would not be going around telling people that's the cure. Milk is slightly um, basic. That's the word I was looking for. And so it can theoretically raise the pH a bit in your, your stomach. Um, that is the reason some people do try to use it. But of course, you know, that doesn't work for everybody, nor does it have like mo – it's not super basic, so it's not doing a huge amount. So go ahead. Go ahead and try it if you like it. Sedragor, can you talk a little bit about your day-to-day? -day? Are you currently practicing or doing policy academic internet stuff? Okay. I'll answer this even though I, – I mean I, I, if you, you're asking, so I'll answer. So um, – my job job is uh, mostly doing research. So, you know, if you if you look at my time at my job job, I spend about 75, 85, 80 percent of my time doing research, maybe 20, 25 percent doing administration. Um, my large grants these days are to I run a center for comparative effectiveness research. Um, we're still finishing up a trial, a randomized controlled trial of clinical decision support to improve type two diabetes. Uh, Diagnosis and Management in Adolescents. We just got a grant to develop some healthcare triage content, which we're very excited about. We just got a grant to do uh, some preliminary work to try to set up randomized controlled trials to see if robotic versus uh, conventional surgery works better for some kids uh, in, with urologic conditions. Um, and then I'm on a few small grants doing stuff. So I spend a decent amount of time, you know, setting that kind of stuff up, running the studies, doing that. You know, some of my week is spent writing my New York Times columns, writing healthcare triage scripts, writing blog posts, writing um, other content that I do for JAMA or for Academy Health. Um, so I would say on a, so Monday, I spend most of my time probably doing research and stuff and work stuff. Tuesday is a little more writing. Wednesday, you're looking at it. Wednesday is my home day. So I, uh, I will work in the morning. We do healthcare triage and the filming and the taping and the healthcare triage live. In the afternoon, I go back to doing writing and getting a lot of work done. Thursday morning is every other week as when I do clinic. I see patients in uh, uh, an outpatient pediatric clinic, mostly acute care, a little bit of well care. Um, then in the afternoon, I have some meetings and I catch up on what's left with writing. And then on Friday, I have a lot of research meetings in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I'm doing lots of research administration stuff. And then throughout the week, I have tons of meetings with mentees and stuff like that because one of my other jobs is I'm associate dean for research mentoring. I run some of the large mentorship programs for the School of Medicine uh, and trying to develop uh, junior faculty who want to have careers as independent investigators. So I have lots of sort of mentorship meetings throughout the week as well. That's an average week. Um, I travel a decent amount to give talks and to go to meetings and stuff like that. Um, and that's probably way more than you ever wanted to notice. And I'm looking at the clock. But I think we have time for one more question. Depp was who asks, is there any evidence that ultrasound, shortwave diathermy, stretching and other, other physiotherapy treatments are effective for muscle strains and injuries? I'm going to guess no. 
And the reason I'm going to guess no is because I think if there was good evidence, like randomized controlled trial evidence, and there should, these should be able to be looked at in randomized controlled trials, and it worked, everyone would know. It would become the standard of care. There would be no reason not to do this stuff if it worked reliably and regularly with people and didn't have many downsides. Now, some of like the back pain things that people talk about, you know, I can't remember some of the, the complex names, but it's the ones where you like insert the caustic agent or that you like, you know, you know, try to use electricity. It's like they they borderline work sometimes in certain randomized controlled trials, but the downsides outweigh the the uh, the, the benefits because even if there's mild incremental benefits, there are some downsides to doing that stuff. But ultrasound is pretty harmless. And this stretching physiotherapy, I mean, stretching, I think, might work. Um, but you know, these things are harmless. So if they worked incredibly well, we would know. Muscle strains and injuries, a lot of times it's just rest. Sometimes physical therapy helps with like, you know, rebuilding strength and making those things work. And there are times, I'm sure, when physical therapy or, or things like that or massage therapy, you know, help in the benefit. But Ultrasound, shortwave diathermy, you know, I, I don't know of any conclusive evidence. If I'm wrong, tweet it at me and I will do an episode on this because if you actually can show me there's good randomized controlled trial at events, we should be screaming this from the mountaintops and everybody should know about it and that should do it. So this often is how I do my common sense gut checks. If there was a pretty common pretty harmless way to cure something that was common, everyone would know. We wouldn't be hiding that. So I'm going to guess no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Let's recap some of the places you can find us. Um, Facebook.com slash healthcare triage. Uh, HTDF, whatever, HCT merch. I can never get that right. Is that right? Dot com. Check us out on the Reddit page. It's r slash HC triage. Of course, patreon.com slash healthcare triage. On Twitter, we're at HC triage. Um, have I missed anything? Always continue to watch Monday, regular healthcare triage. Wednesday, healthcare triage live. Friday, healthcare triage news. This week's episode's awesome. We just taped it. It's going to be great. Um, and we got some great upcoming regular healthcare triage episodes as well. Thank you as always for tuning in. We'll see you next week.